Welcome to today's Parabos webinar. For those of you who are new to Parabos, Parabos is Australia's resource for the control of worms, lice, flies and ticks and is a joint initiative from Australian Wool Innovation, Meat and Livestock Australia, the University of New England and Animal Health Australia. Today we will be talking all about ticks and we're going to talk about the management of cattle ticks and tick fever and we're joined today by two experts in the field, Dr. Phil Carter and Dr. Lee Taylor. My name is Fiona MacArthur and I'm a member of the Parabos Extension team. A little room, bit of housekeeping before we kick off today. Our webinars are all recorded and this is good for you because you'll be able to get the recordings later on online as well. Thanks, Phil and Lee, I'll hand over to you now and touch base with you after the presentation. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Fiona. And uh, thanks everyone for uh, attending the webinar today. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, tick fever uh, and some reference to cattle ticks, particularly in relation to tick fever. Uh, Lee, Lee will cover um, the, the tick part, uh, control and, and current seasonal conditions, uh, and I'll, I'll go through the tick fever part. Um, but if you need more info on actual cattle tick management, Lee gave a, a Parabos webinar back in August, so you could search that up if you need more info. So I'll just launch into it now. So uh, look at the cattle tick first. There's there's many different species of ticks uh, that can infest cattle, but uh, today we're, we're talking about the cattle tick. Um, it's now called Ripocephalus australis, um, but was known for many decades as Boophilus microplus. You probably might have heard that name. Uh, the map on the screen shows the distribution of the cattle tick, uh, that darker area in the map, uh, being mainly eastern Queensland up to about the level of Townsville, at which point it sweeps across the top tropical north of Australia. Uh, and that tick infested zone is artificially maintained by regulatory action along the tick line. Uh, the ticks would happily survive in a wider area, uh, at least intermittently, if it wasn't for that control. Uh, ticks are parasites and they take advantage of the animal host to complete their life cycle. Uh, that life cycle consists of a parasitic phase where we see the ticks on the cattle and a free living non-parasitic phase where they're down in the pasture. Uh, the parasitic phase has got three stages, larva, nymph and adults. And in the case of cattle ticks, all three of those stages occur on the one host in quick succession. So it's called a one host tick uh, and that's as opposed to the other tick species uh, that you might have uh, that are three host ticks and spend a different stage on a, on a different host. Um, but this one host life cycle has advantages for us in that the longer time spent on the one host makes it easier for us to uh, treat and kill to get rid of it. So just a bit about the life cycle. Um, the parasitic phase consisting of the larval, nymph and adult stages is roughly about three weeks long with each stage lasting about a week. Uh, the larvae, uh, which are the, the little tiny ones, the bottom left of the, the, the uh, picture there, jumping up onto the uh, head of the cow, doesn't have to be the head of course. Um, they're, they're tiny, about the size of a grain of sand uh, and they hatch from eggs on pasture and climb onto passing animals. After feeding for about a week, they molt on that on that host and become nymphs. The nymphs then molt again on that same host and become adults, which may be either male or female. Uh, the female adults continue to be attached to the host and suck blood throughout, whereas the males uh, are very mobile and they move from female to female, doing what males do, uh, and suck blood intermittently. Uh, and they can remain on the host for twice as long as the females. So the females keep sucking blood uh, and fill up and then detach and fall to the ground where the eggs develop inside them over a couple of weeks before they start laying them. Uh, and each female can lay up to about 3000 eggs. So that gives that uh, very dramatic spring rise when they start to do that. Uh, the eggs incubate in the environment before hatching uh, and hatching is affected by environmental conditions with warm, humid conditions stimulating hatching uh, and cool weather can delay hatching. So the non-parasitic phase can vary from about six weeks under ideal warm, moist conditions 
to about six or seven months if it's a bit cooler. And so the cycle continues on and on and you get that rapid rise. So I'm just going to hand over to Lee now to go through a few tick and seasonal issues. Over to you, Lee. Okay, thanks, Phil. Um, so I would refer you back to the webinar that I did in August just for a bit more background on this. Um, we're certainly well into what normally would be or what is the spring rise. Um, it, it has been, I don't, I don't think anyone needs to be reminded how dry it has been, and that certainly does have a, an impact on on just how much that uh, increase in tick population uh, will be you know, until such time as we do see some rain. But uh, it has been interesting talking to people uh, just because of the very the, the other graph I could have, or the other um, map I could have put up was our uh, winter temperature map, and it's it's been very mild. Um, so we don't certainly in southeast Queensland we we don't appear to have had the suppression of uh, the larval tick populations on pasture or the 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 die off of larval ticks on pasture associated with the uh, with frosty cold conditions during the winter that we would normally see. So I've talked to people uh, recently who are battling quite significant uh, tick populations on their cattle, despite the fact that they haven't had any rain and, and it is very dry. And obviously there's, um, there's significant uh, numbers of tick larvae that have survived the this dry condition and are now looking for, um, for a host and wanting to complete their life cycle because it is warm enough and uh, in many cases on and off it's been humid enough for them to to, to become active. Um, so yeah the, the tick populations um, will, will vary depending very much on how much um, what level of control of ticks there was coming into the winter. Uh, people who had uh, clean paddocks will still have clean paddocks but people who had um, paddocks that were quite ticky and would normally rely on um, the, the cold uh, winter conditions to knock those tick populations back a bit um, won't be seeing that usual reduction in larval ticks that they would be used to. Next slide, please. Uh, so in terms of the pro you know, production impacts of ticks, uh, you know, they, they obviously have a, a direct impact on production through sucking blood. Um, I forget the exact statistic, but there, there, there's an amount, you know, ticks suck a certain amount of blood and that has a, a measurable, they've been able to document the, the, the impact that that has on, uh, on performance. They also cause tick worry. So, you know, just the, as you can see in this picture, you know, that, that population of ticks would be incredibly irritating for that animal. That impacts on their grazing behaviour and um, also devalues their hides. Um, the, the element that we're going to focus on today is their ability to transmit tick fever, which in itself has a production loss and is responsible for mortality. And then on top of that are the associated control costs. And... Uh, Meat like well, like meat and livestock Australia go through a uh, process of determining the economic impact of endemic disease every few years in order to prioritise uh, uh, investment and cattle ticks uh, certainly come up um, in the top one or two issues Australia wide. A lot of a lot of that cost associated with the ticks is control costs, and as Phil pointed out. Um, earlier uh, you know we, we spend a lot of money maintaining or, or controlling our or keeping our tick population within the tick endemic area uh, north of the tick line and if we stop doing that uh, we, we get rid of those control costs for ticks would uh, quite happily survive over a much greater area of Australia uh, and then there is the associated cost of tick fever estimated at around $7 million. Um, so next slide, please, Phil. Um, so as I pointed out in the August webinar, spring is the time to be getting into your tick control program. You really need to work on suppressing the 
tick pop or the build up of the tick population over the spring, what is referred to as a spring rise. Um, that generally requires a succession of treatments. Um, and the other time to also look at treatment is, is in the autumn uh, to try and tidy up pastures going into the winter and that reduces the the tick population, the larval tick population that, that then contribute to the next spring rise. Uh, so the, the August Parabos webinar provides more detail. Uh, the other thing to, to be mindful of at the moment, just with the dry conditions, um, the, uh, the you know, cattle are getting down in condition and uh, a number of Tick control, a number of products that we do rely on for tick control, so Fluazuron and the MLs, so uh, Moxidectin in particular being quite lipophilic, but to some extent all of the ML chemicals require body fat for persistence. If animals are very, very skinny, uh, that degree of persistence may be reduced. So, um, and particularly so for Fluazuron, and particularly if cows are also lactated. Um, so that's just a, you know, an, an aspect of uh, the way those chemicals work that people need to be mindful of at the moment if their cows are uh, quite skinny. Um, okay, back to you, Phil. No, thanks, Lee. And uh, yeah, we'll spend the rest of the time looking at tick fever now. And I do have quite a few slides here, so we'll see how we go for time. We can um, skip over a few of the end ones if we need to. Um, so yeah, tick fever is a tick transmitted disease um, of cattle caused by one of three blood parasites or organisms, um, those three listed there on the screen. Uh, two of those are related protozoal organisms and the other is a completely unrelated bacterial organism but just happens to have the same tick vector, so it's lumped together. Uh, the most common cause is due to Babesia bovis, um, accounting for about 80% of all confirmed outbreaks in Queensland, as you can see in that that orange bar on the graph there. Um, it's the most common because it's the nastiest of the three, um, causes a much more severe disease. Uh, and it's also the most common because it's less common in the tick population, which seems a bit weird, but um, ticks carry a lot less Babesia bovis than they do Babesia bigemina, for instance. And so natural immunity is much less likely. So um, animals don't develop that immunity early on in life. And when they come across it later, they're, they're still non-immune and then get sick when they see it. Um, Babesia bigemina and Anaplasma marginale, they're the other two occasional causes of tick fever outbreaks, generally milder, but um, can be severe in those instances where they do cause um, disease and, and can be responsible for deaths. Um, so as the name suggests, uh, it has fever as a feature, but that's particularly so with Babesia bovis, can be very high fever, 42, 43 degrees. Um, <clears> that's an irregular finding with the other two causes. Maybe there, may not. Uh, all three also cause anemia due to the destruction of blood, although they differ in how they do that. Um, so anyway, we end up with animals with a fever, may or may not have a fever, um, and low oxygen carrying capacity due to the anemia. So they're going to be weak and lethargic. They're just going to be not their happy selves. They may be seeking shade or standing in the creek or the dam to cool down, uh, or they may be down and just too weak to get back up. Uh, animals with Babesia often have red urine, um, hence the other name for the disease of red water. Uh, and that's from the blood destruction going on in their body. Um, but animals with anaplasmosis, they don't get that red urine because it's a different uh, method of blood destruction. Uh, they also may be jaundiced or yellow due to the deposition of blood breakdown product, products in their tissues. Um, and often animals with Babesia bovis may be sick um, before they even become anemic or jaundiced. So that you may just see um, very depressed, lethargic cattle. Uh, animals with Babesia bovis may also display neurological signs such as being aggressive, um, or head pressing, uh, you know, pressing their head up against the fence post. Uh, and that's due to the lack of oxygenation in the brain. Uh, and usually that's a, a terminal sign. They, they don't get better once they show those signs, even if you treat them. 
so the cost of tick fever, well, mortalities are, are um, the typical measure, um, but mortality rate may be, may be small due to a proportion of animals in the mob already having some protective immunity from previous exposure. However, it can be high in naive populations such as those that don't have adequate natural exposure um, or introduced cattle. Um, so you can see really high mortality rates in those. Um, apart from death, uh, it also can result in abortions in pregnant cattle just due to that um, fever and or the uh, anemia. Uh, and we can also have loss of fertility in bulls, again, due to the fever. Uh, there can be a marked milk production drop, um, especially important in, in dairy cows, uh, and other costs associated with treatment and mustering. And they can be substantial in those big, extensively managed herds where it takes teams of people to muster animals in. Um, there's also potential for loss of health, uh, loss of export health status. Um, some, some protocols state you must not have had a tick fever outbreak within the last six months, uh, otherwise you can't send your cattle on, on to those markets. Uh, and then there's also the prevention costs such as vaccination and tick control costs. And um, yeah, in that same MLA project uh, back in 2022, they uh, estimated tick fever to be worth about or to cost about $7 million, um, partly in uh, uh, prevention costs, vaccination, and partly in, in losses, production losses. So how do they get tick fever? Well, uh, as I mentioned, it's transmitted by the cattle tick. Therefore, it exists in that same zone that I showed on the map where the cattle tick exists. Um, but there's differences between the three different tick fever organisms in how they're transmitted. So I'll just overlay the transmission over the tick life cycle. So above this line on the screen uh, is the parasitic phase on the animal and below the line is the non-parasitic phase in the pasture. So the adult tick drops off the animals and lays eggs in the pasture. I think that should be changing, there we go. Uh, and a small percentage of these eggs may contain either of the Babesia organisms, um, but that's not the case with anaplasma. Anaplasma won't go through to the next generation of ticks, but Babesia will. Uh, so those eggs after a certain incubation time in the pasture will then hatch larvae and, um, and a small proportion of those will contain that Babesia. And that's if the tick that the animal dropped off was feeding on a, a Babesia infected animal to, um, to maintain that cycling. Um, so the, next one up, the larvae climb up onto the host and it's this stage that transmits Babesia bovis, which is responsible for most of our outbreaks and it's responsible and it's also the most severe of the outbreaks. Uh, and that can occur, that transmission occurs within one to three days of the tick getting on the animal. So it's really quick. Uh, and, then, and then it takes another two weeks roughly until you see clinical signs of infection. Now, after a week on the animal, the larva then molts into a nymph. And at this point, it loses its ability to transmit Babesia bovis, but it can transmit Babesia bigemina at this stage, uh, potentially anaplasma marginale, but uncommon, which I'll get into in a minute. Uh, then the tick molts again, as we've talked about, into the adult stage, the female and male. Uh, and this stage is more commonly associated with transmission of anaplasma. Now, because anaplasma isn't transmitted through the egg to the next generation of ticks, the ticks picked up off the paddock are clean in relation to anaplasma. They can't get anaplasma from those ticks, uh, at least initially. Those ticks have to feed on a carrier animal to pick up the infection and then transfer to another animal to then spread that infection. But the tick is firmly attached throughout its life cycle. So how does it transfer from one animal to another? Well, it's, it's that mobile male tick that I mentioned before. It can cross from one animal to another when they're in close contact, such as, you know, at feeding or water troughs or cattle camps or, you know, cow and calf um, laying down next to each other. Uh, and that's how anaplasma is transmitted via the male tick. 
Um, Anaplasma is a, a very slow growing organism. So it can take another three or six, three to six weeks for disease to be evident. So just a few factors to think about uh, in relation to whether we see disease or not. Uh, and there's three, three, these factors are broken down into three categories. The first one is environment, uh, and that affects whether the tick vector is present or not, um, and also the number of ticks that can be present. So ticks can be seasonal, um, liking the warmer, humid conditions, tailing off in the cooler, drier conditions, at least in the southeast here. Um, although, as Lee said, um, they're persisting um, through the winter uh, this year with the warmer conditions, milder, milder winter. Um, and certainly up north, they're, they're often present year round in the tropical zones. Uh, another category uh, that we look at is the host, uh, the, um, the agent factors, so the actual organism. Uh, and there can be differences in the um, nastiness between the three species, as I mentioned, Babesia bovis is, is more nasty than the other two. But even within the one species, there's also differences in isolates or strains. So you can get really mild uh, isolates that don't cause much disease at all. And then you can get those really nasty ones as well. It just depends which ones your cattle come across as to whether they're going to get sick or not. Um, also, tick populations vary in the um, in the tick infection rate. So the, 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 the percentage of ticks that are infected with these organisms, uh, some can be really low, like one in 5,000 ticks, for instance, and some can be um, you know, much higher than that. And Babesia bigemina is typically much higher than Babesia bovis. So we see more natural infection, more, more, more natural, uh, naturally acquired immunity to Babesia bigemina, uh, which is one of the reasons why we don't see as much disease with Babesia bigemina, because they're more likely to become immune early in life. Uh, and the third category to look at are the host factors. And there's two of them I was going to mention in particular over the next couple of slides. First one is breed, um, and that's that's an important consideration. Uh, Bos indicus or, or Brahmin type cattle are much more resistant to ticks, um, and they carry less ticks, and they're also inherently resistant to Babesia, uh, especially Babesia bigemina. Uh, whereas your Bos taurus breeds, such as your British or your Euros, or even your African Sanger breeds, they're quite susceptible to ticks and to tick fever organisms. Uh, the resistance conferred by Brahmin cattle can be passed on to their crosses, although the degree of resistance does become diluted by the boss taurus in the cross. So a shorthorn, for instance, over on the left of the screen there, is less resistant than a Santa, which is what shorthorn and Brahmin genetics, um, and that's less resistant than a full Brahmin. Uh, Brahmin cattle tend to be quite common in that hotter or more tropical zone due to their better tolerance of those harsher environmental conditions. And so losses due to tick fever will be much less due to that high Brahmin content. However, as the degree of Bostaurus increases to meet market specifications for meat quality, for instance, then the susceptibility to tick fever and to ticks can increase. The other important uh, host factor is age. And this, this is what a lot of people do rely upon for control. So calves are inherently much more resistant to the clinical effects of infection than, than adults. So they become infected, but they don't get sick. Uh, and that age-related resistance is not related to the colostrum or whether their mother was immune. It's, it's present in all calves. And it gradually wanes over time so that by 9 to 12 to 15 months of age, they become fully susceptible to clinical disease. So an animal that's infected as a calf while resistant, it's naturally resistant, uh, won't get sick, but it'll develop this immunity, uh, which persists for the life of the animal. Uh, so when that animal with the acquired immunity, immunity then comes across ticks again later in its life, it, it's fine. It gets infected again, but the immunity is present and stops it developing into full-blown disease. So they live. Compared to the young animal down the bottom of the screen there, which doesn't have enough tick exposure and therefore doesn't develop an immunity to the tick fever organisms. So later on in life, again, ticks jump on and transmit one of those tick fever bugs uh, and the outcome might not be so good. So some will get sick and some of those will die. 
because they don't have that pre-existing immunity. Um, so it's the age at the first exposure that determines the outcome. If first exposure is young, then that protects them for life. If first exposure is when they're older and susceptible, then the outcome's not so great. Um, just a quick word on treatment. Um, I didn't have this in here originally, but I thought I'd better stick it in. Um, imidacarb or uh, imidox uh, is what it's known as in the market. It's the only registered drug for the treatment of Babesia. Um, it's given at one mil per 100 kilos subcutaneously and has a meat withhold period of 28 days. Um, and it can be used in lactating dairy cows in Queensland and New South Wales only under a permit from APVMA. Uh, and that has a 14 day withhold, but that only covers that low dose, one mil per 100 kilos. Uh, with anaplasma, imidox can also be used to treat that, but you have to give it at two and a half times the dose rate, so 2.5 mils per 100 kilos. Um, but that rate's not covered by that APVMA permit for dairy cattle. However, anaplasma is also sensitive to the antibiotic oxytetracycline, and there's, there's many brands of that, and they have various durations and withholding periods. Um, so into control of tick fever, I've got a, what is it, five there? listed and we'll go through each of those in turn. So the first one is breed. Um, so as I mentioned, Bos indicus genetics increase resistance and therefore does reduce losses. It's a very good um, method to control tick fever, um, but that resistance is reduced as you cross Bos taurus genetics uh, into the mix. And, and, and many outbreaks do occur in Brahmin cross or Brahmin infused cattle, uh, although they rarely occur in pure Brahmin cattle. Uh, Brahmins are inherently susceptible to anaplasma, maybe not as susceptible as Bostaurus breeds, but they, they still can get sick and die from anaplasma. But because pure Brahmins carry fewer ticks, um, anaplasma outbreaks tend not to be common despite that susceptibility. Uh, and there's been some interest um, recently in introducing tropically adapted African Sanger breeds, such as Thule's and Senapoles. Uh, these breeds, though, are Bostaurus, not Bos indicus and they are as susceptible to tick fever as any other Euro or British uh, Bos taurus breed. And we've done trials with both Thule's and Senapoles back at tick fever, um, my days at tick fever, uh, and they were um, just as susceptible as the, um, as the, as the British breed. Um, so the next thing is relying on natural exposure. I mean, and, and, and many people rely on this and, and everyone would love to do this um, because it's the simplest because it involves doing nothing. Um, it, it aims to take advantage of the natural calf hood resistance that I just talked about. Uh, so the idea is having all or most of your animals exposed early in life so that later on they're protected by that acquired immunity from that initial infection. Uh, and that all sounds great in theory, but unfortunately there's a few drawbacks. Uh, because tick infection rates are often quite low, you actually need many thousands of ticks to infect, infect each animal by nine months of age. And that's quite a lot of ticks, uh, especially for a calf. And it's quite dependent on seasonal conditions. So when you go through a dry spell, uh, you may not have as many ticks um, around to get the vast majority of your herd infected. And then when conditions improve and, and ticks increase, you may get more transmission in those previously unexposed animals and that can lead to large losses. Uh, additionally, people are reluctant to allow large burdens on young calves. And so they may treat for ticks periodically, uh, which is a good thing, but it also reduces that natural exposure. And, and that will then mean that those, those cattle may be more susceptible to future infections. And uh, as mentioned, breed resistance may also limit the amount of exposure obtained if there's some Brahmin infusion within your breed or your cross. So it's hard to achieve this stability for one parasite, let alone all three. And blood testing surveys done in Queensland in the 90s found that in many parts, many properties did not have acquired immunity in a sufficient proportion of their herd to, be, uh, to have a stable non-disease uh, status. So it's a risky method since you're at the mercy of so many variables. Uh, and the, the majority of outbreaks actually do occur in homebred cattle relying on this method. So and people get away with it for years and years and then something changes 
and the, and the balance gets out of whack and, and bam, you've got an outbreak. So yeah, it can be, it can be, it, it's, it's good in theory, but it can be difficult in practice to ensure that all cattle are exposed early in life every year. Um, so uh, tick control is a, is a potential. Some people like to use tick control. Um, but we, we, we would always say tick control is for controlling ticks, not tick fever, because you can't prevent transmission of Babesia bovis with tick control. So the systemic ticicides, like your porons and injectables, all those convenient ones, they work too slowly compared to that fast transmission rate of Babesia bovis. So the ticks have transmitted the bug long before they've even thought about dying. And the contact ticicides, where, which are the chemicals where you saturate the animal in a, in a spray or a, or a plunge dip like this picture here, um, they, they do kill the ticks very quickly, but they have very short duration of action. So they can just pick up more ticks in a few days after treatment and then transmission occurring the next day or so after that. So the only way tick control prevents transmission of tick fever is if, if it's used to completely eradicate the tick. Uh, that'll prevent transmission in the long run, but not necessarily during the eradication process. Um, but eradication is difficult and expensive to do, uh, especially on an individual property, uh, especially in an endemic area, uh, where the risk of reinfestation can be high from neighbours or introducing other, other cattle. Uh, it, it can be done, it has been done on a regional basis, but requires the cooperation of all neighbours, and that can be even more difficult to achieve. Um, and, and in the end, it will result in a susceptible herd over time because you've got no new natural transmissions occurring. And that's fine if you can be guaranteed that ticks are, uh, stay out. But if they do get back in because uh, they've come in via neighbours or you've introduced cattle and they've got a sneaky tick on them, then you can result in large outbreaks in that susceptible herd. Um, I just thought I'd mention Imidox as a potential method of control. It's the treatment for tick fever, as I just mentioned, but at that high dose rate of two and a half times the normal treatment dose, it can be used to prevent Babesia infection for about a month. So it needs to be done monthly and that makes it expensive. Um, it also has no preventative effect against anaplasma, although repeated high doses will treat new infections, um, except for that last, after the last dose, you know, you can still get anaplasma transmission. Um, there is some concern with immunity, though, when animals are subsequently vaccinated. It, it's just never as effective. We do see breakdowns in immunity, vaccine immunity, uh, in animals that have previously been treated with, with Imidox. Even, even if you wait the, the recommended two months after treatment, um, there's still some animals that just don't seem to respond to the vaccine. So if, you, if you're thinking of um, vaccinating, it's best not to in include Imidox into the mix, um, try and avoid it. Uh, there's also some reports in the literature of toxicity with repeated use, um, causing ulceration in the intestines um, as the bile uh, is excreted into the intestines. Uh, I I'm not sure how common that is. I don't think it's very common. It just has been reported. Um, so it's, it's, it's okay for short-term protection, like animals just transiting through a ticky zone, like at a show, but that's, it's, there, there are better options for, for longer-term control. And that, that brings me on to vaccination. Uh, so a single vaccination gives long-term immunity. Uh, it mimics, it basically mimics the natural exposure method and gives peace of mind in that you know all animals are exposed to all three types rather than guessing or hoping that they're exposed to all three types with the natural immunity method, you know, because you've, you've given it. Um, it's, it's a cost-effective tool with the cost of the single dose of vaccine being accrued over the life of the animal. So it's one dose for life in general. Sometimes we recommend a second dose for animals coming in from tick-free areas. Um, it improves survival uh, and it also improves welfare outcomes because you don't have those sick cows, the ones that don't die, they, they still might get sick um, and lose weight or have reproductive um, effects. So it improves welfare outcomes, especially in those boss taurus herds. Um, but it does have some shortcomings. It is, it is a live blood-based product and therefore it is fragile and needs to be kept cool. And it only has a short shelf life of only four days, uh, which is 
very short compared to all the other vaccines. So it requires planning into when you need it and ordering it specifically for that time. And most people that use it know all about that and 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 have it have it ready to use when they need it. There's also some concern about vaccine reactions, which are cases of tick fever caused by the organisms in the vaccine. I'll speak a bit more about that in the next slide. Um, so the vaccine is made by the Queensland Department of Agriculture at the Tick Fever Centre, and you can phone them to order it, or you may be able to order it uh, via your agent or, or rural store. Speak to them about that. So a few problems to go through, vaccine reactions uh, is the first one. I'll go through each of these if I've got time. How are we going for time? We've got running out of time. Um, so we'll start with the assumption that vaccine reactions are common. Uh, this can be, this may be a carryover from the, the pre mid nineties when the strains used were a bit hotter. Um, people have long memories about um, vaccine strains killing cattle back to the eighties and seventies. Um, but the current strain, which is been in there since the mid 90s, it's really quite mild um, and reactions are not common. Uh, reactions aren't an issue in, in calves and weaners due to that strong age resistance, um, but there is potential for adult cattle to have reactions. However, over the, over the decades, uh, many tens or hundreds of thousands of cattle have been vaccinated and reactions are just not common. Sure, they do get reported, um, but most times they turn out not to be vaccine reactions. They turn to be out, turn out to be um, naturally transmitted field infections. Um, that's not to say they don't happen, but they're just not common. They're not as common as people think. Um, there is a precaution on the label regarding use in pregnant cattle in that a sustained fever can cause an abortion, but if an animal's going to be so naive so susceptible um, to have a reaction to the vaccine, then they're sure as hell going to react uh, poorly or worsely uh, to the more virulent uh, tick transmitted strains that are out there. Uh, we, we used to say it was the lesser of the two evils. The vaccine parasites um, are much more mild than what's out there. You may get reactions, but the reaction tends to be more mild than what you get in the in the naturally transmitted uh, isolates. Uh, one one client of mine used to say he'd rather have a live empty cow than a dead pregnant one, so he always vaccinated. Um, the message here is to monitor vaccinated adult cattle closely. Uh, we know when the Babesia reactions will occur, so we can focus all our efforts into monitoring between day 10 and day 21 after vaccination. Typically, it's about two weeks after. Um, anaplasma comes through uh, much later, so between day 30, which is really quite soon, uh, oh. and day 60 or 70, typically more, more, more so in that later stage. Um, but reactions to anaplasma are even rarer than the reactions to Babesia. Um, we have seen a couple in dairy cattle where the calving period and, and early lactation coincides with that uh, reaction period, but Oh, I could count them on, on one hand. Um, Babesia reactions can be treated with imidox um, and anaplasma reactions can be treated with oxytet. But just remember, if you're treating for reactions, it will knock out the vaccine. And so uh, another vaccination will be required in a couple of months down the track. So don't be too trigger happy with the imidox. Um, the next mixed conception is that homebred cattle in ticky areas will have sufficient natural immunity and that you only need to vaccinate cattle introduced from tick-free areas. As mentioned, uh, with the do-nothing approach uh, to tick fever control, the assumption that you've had sufficient exposure to all parasites every year may be wrong. Most of the confirmed outbreaks have actually occurred in unvaccinated homebred stock. Uh, and as I mentioned, the blood testing surveys done showed that that level of exposure wasn't there in, in a lot of places. Um, similarly, some believe that because cattle have been bred in the ticky zone, that they'll be fine when shifted to another property within the ticky zone. And in many cases, that, that may be the case. But in some cases, that's, that's not right, because there are differences in tick exposure on different properties. They may have come from a property with very low exposure, and so a large proportion of the herd are still susceptible, and then they go to a property with a higher tick um, level or a higher tick infection rate and get uh, exposure. And, and subsequent disease and death. Um, so vaccination just takes that guesswork out of the equation. You know they're all exposed then. 
Um, the next problem we look at is vaccination on arrival to a tiki property. This is quite a common scenario. Uh, it's a problem because the vaccine does take some time to stimulate that immune response. Uh, it's not immediate. It takes about three to four weeks for Babesia and eight to 10 weeks for anaplasma. So you can get transmission of the organisms from ticks and clinical disease after introduction and before immunity has established. Uh, and keeping the ticks off to prevent transmission is difficult as we've just talked about. Uh, so whilst not always possible, it's a far better idea to vaccinate prior to arrival, at least three weeks prior if possible, so that they've got some immunity to Babesia bovis before they get there. Uh, other potential options are to adjust um, for a short term in a tick-free country for three to four weeks uh, prior to introduction, or to house them on introduction and feed them in dirt um, yards or concrete yards. And th that's a harsher environment for ticks to survive. However, I have seen cases in, of tick fever in yards um, because of the grass around the edge of the yards and the cattle have stuck their heads through and grazed that grass and, and picked up ticks uh, for, from that. So it's not foolproof. Um, but again, because we know the timing of introduction, we can focus efforts into monitoring cattle in that first three to four weeks after the introduction to detect that depression and lethargy, which are the initial signs of tick fever. Um, and, and it's the same as if it's a vaccine reaction. So we'll be detecting both at once. But most, most commonly it's tick transmitted disease, not vaccine reactions in testing that we've done. Uh, so another thing I used to often hear was people treating with a poron on arrival on the assumption that this will protect them and keep the vaccine uh, until the vaccine kicks in. I think I think we've already covered that. It, it doesn't work. Those those porons uh, and injectables they 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 work too slowly, so you can get transmission. Um, and the and the contact carousides are very short acting. But having said that, I don't really think that you don't need to do any tick control. I think it's um, still important because we don't want the these naive cattle being fully loaded up on ticks and getting a tick anemia, because when the vaccine does come through uh, at the, you know two weeks or so after vaccination, uh, there will be an anemia associated with that. It's mostly not apparent, but if you're already anemic because you've got a load of ticks sucking all your blood out and then you get another anemia on top of that, then you can um, tip them over into that vaccine reactions when they might not have otherwise had it. The last issue we'll look at is um, lighting up ticks, uh, another 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 common one people have um, worried about the vaccine organisms infecting their ticks. Uh, and, and the vaccine strain of Babesia bovis is tick transmissible. Uh, and, it, and it does become more virulent or nasty when it does go back through the ticks. However, that nastiness is not as nasty as other virulent isolates out there. It's still a mild organism compared to nasty things out there. So we tend not to think of it as a problem in the tick endemic areas, that is where ticks already are, because where ticks are, tick fever organisms are also there. And there's always carrier animals around anyway. Uh, so they represent a source of uh, infection to the ticks anyway. So research done over the years looking at outbreaks on properties next door to properties that vaccinate did not identify the vaccine strain as the cause of the outbreak. It was always uh, a different isolate, an isolate with a different genetic makeup than what's in the vaccine. However, it can be a concern in clean tick populations. So those are tick outbreaks that occur in the tick-free areas. And they've usually resulted from the introduction of a relatively small population of ticks. And because of the low tick infection rates, they're statistically likely to be uninfected. So in those cases, those clean tick outbreaks, Vaccination is not needed as the population is clean. And if you do introduce vaccine, you could, in fact, light those ticks up. Not that that would matter on that particular property because they'd all be immune anyway. But if it's spread to the next door neighbours, well, then it could be a problem. Um, but if you do have tick fever already occurring in that tick-free zone, then you've already got it. So introducing vaccine is not going to be a problem. In fact, it'll help ensure survival of the remaining cattle. Um, the vaccine strain of Babesia bigemina 
is not transmissible, or if it is, it's poorly transmissible. We haven't been able to transmit it with the cattle tick in Australia. Um, and the vaccine also contains anaplasma centrale, not anaplasma marginale. It's, it's provided there to provide cross protection against anaplasma marginale. And we don't have the tick vector for centrale in Australia. The, uh, the Ripocephalus australis does not transmit centrale. So that's all we wanted to talk to you about today. Um, just in conclusion, uh, monitor for ticks and begin treatments on that spring rise. Uh, understand tick fever to avoid costly losses. So hopefully you've got a better understanding of what tick fever is and what it does now. Um, and consider vaccinating against tick fever because it's the uh, it's probably the best um, the best long term control we have. Um, apart from high grade Brahmins. But if you don't have high grade Brahmins, then, then vaccination is, is the way to go. So I think that's it, Fiona, if you wanna open up for any um, questions. Thanks very much, Phil and Lee. Great presentation. I love a good myth busting session. I don't think I've had a better one on a Parabos webinar than that, Phil, well done. So we are now ready to start our Q&A session. So if you'd like to put your questions into the Q&A now, I'll deliver them for you to Phil and Lee. So the first one we've actually, you did address, but I'll ask it again in case you have any closing remarks on it, Phil. And it is, does the tick fever vaccine affect pregnant cattle? Yeah, only, only if they react, only if they get a fever, basically. Um, it, and it's it's more so, um, I suppose, really late in pregnancy. If you get a fever, and it's it's got to be a, a, you know, a reasonable fever and lasting a few days, you can disrupt or, or you know, induce an abortion uh, in that cow. But if they, if they don't have that reaction, and remember, reactions are not very common, then then there'll be no effect on the pregnancy. Uh, it may also be an issue uh, at the very start of pregnancy. So while implantation of the embryo is occurring, you don't want a fever then either. Mid-pregnancy, it's it's generally fine. Um, but we know we know when reactions will occur. So if you monitor them starting at about day 10 after vaccination and you notice them getting a bit doughy, um, if you can bring them in and take their temp, fever is a really good indicator early in it's it shows up earlier than other things. So if you can notice them being a bit um, lethargic or doughy or lagging in the mob, um, you know, if you can if you can get them into the yards, which is not always possible, but if you can, take their temp. And if they've got a skyrocketing temperature, um, you can treat that and 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 uh, treat that reaction and uh, basically prevent any further consequence apart from they then won't have an immunity to tick fever and might need to be revaccinated down the track. Thanks, Phil. So would you recommend if you've got to come in and treat them that you tag them or something in the mob so that you know that they're one of them that hasn't been part of the vaccine program the next year? Yeah, yep, yep. So if you can um, identify them somehow, either just write down number down or, yeah, as you say, stick a tag in them. Uh, if you've had to treat them for a reaction, uh, you can um, get them back in at some point down the track. Uh, certainly not within two months because the imazole residues all keep knocking it out. But um, a few months after treatment, you can revaccinate um, yeah, if, if you know which ones they were. Yeah, great. Some people get a bit a bit trigger happy, and you know they might have a reaction, and they think, "Oh no," and they go through and anything that looks sideways at them, they hit with imidox when, when in fact they might have been fine um, because not all animals develop that high fever. Some, some do develop a mild fever. And then if you, if you take their temperature and you notice there's a bit, a bit of a mild fever, and well, I wouldn't necessarily treat them on that day unless they are very clinically unwell. Um, if they actually aren't too bad uh, and they've got a mild fever, you can let them go a day take the temperature again the next day. Uh, in, in a lot of cases, it'll have gone back down or it might still be a little mild fever. But if it's gone up to a really high fever, like, you know, 41.5 or 42 or something, then I'd treat them. But if they're just 40.5, uh, 
uh, 40, 40.5. I, I just monitor them and see how they go. Thanks, Phil. Um, we'll stick with vaccinations. I'm just going to go out of order for a minute. Um, this person's neighbour insists that the vaccination is specific to a certain area, um, i.e. that the vaccine is made tailored to your location, but it sounds like this isn't true. No, no, it's the one strain that's been used since 1993 and that's it covers everywhere in Australia or everywhere that tick fever is. So there's only one strain there, Phil? Oh, one, one strain of Babesia bovis, I meant. Um, and Babesia bigemina, again, that's that's the one strain and that's been used since the 70s. Uh, and Anaplasma centrale, that's just the one strain and that's been used since 1934. So it's, Yeah. <laughs> Tried and tested. They've been yeah. around for a while. Um, how long post-infection before you see parasites come up in the blood smear? Uh, usually at about the same time that we see sick animals. So it's, it's around about that, that, that 10 to 21 days, typically two weeks, you know, typically. Was that following infection or vaccination? Doesn't say there. No, that's about the same anyway. But um, vaccine parasitemia is very low. Like uh, it, it, it's almost impossible to find Babesia bovis after vaccination. It comes through at such low levels. You, you really got to hunt to look for it. Babesia bigemina you can find usually about day seven, eight, nine after vaccination. But it's so mild we, we've never seen a, a, a clinical reaction with Babesia bigemina. Mm -hmm. And the last question that I have for now, so this is your last chance to add questions to the Q&A panel and then we'll close the webinar off. Is there a pour-on or injectable program that can be used to sterilise male ticks? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll attack that one. Um, so male ticks, uh, all, all, all of the registered ticocytes kill the male ticks. Um, they don't obviously engorged to the extent that female ticks do, so they don't get as big and full of blood, but they still have to suck blood in order to survive. Um, so uh, in terms of, you know, the, the, the carasite treatments will kill the male ticks. Um, the, the main in, one impact that uh, certainly the, the macrocyclic lactones, so you you your ivermectin, your moxidectin, your doramectin. When you treat animals with those chemicals, there is a there is an impact on the the viability of the eggs that are laid by female ticks for variable periods after treatment. Um, it does vary with product. Uh, there is a, a registered claim uh, for that post treatment effect on um, cytectin LA, I believe. Um, so the long acting moxidectin injectable products but some of the others do have some impact on the viability of eggs but all, all of the all of the acaricide treatments so your dips your sprays um, your um, your porons your fluazeron have an impact on males and male and female ticks um, so the male ticks are, are killed when you when you when you treat them with those chemicals as, as well as the female ticks great thanks Lee. Um, that brings us to the end of question time. Thank you, everyone, for putting your questions in and take this opportunity to thank both Phil and Lee for joining us today. It was a fantastic presentation. I got a lot out of it and we were spoilt to have both of you on board. So thanks very much for coming. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So just a little bit of housekeeping before I finish up. There'll be a link that will show up in your browser at the conclusion of today's webinar. It will always be sent out to you as well in a follow-up email. A couple of short questions, so I thank you in advance for filling it in. There'll be an opportunity there to write a few comments about webinars that you would like to see for 2024, and I am in the process over the end of this year coming up with those webinar topics and finding speakers. So now is absolutely your chance to have a say. So I encourage you to give me some feedback. So before we head off, thank you for supporting our webinar series this year. And I hope you all have an enjoyable break over summer and we look forward to you joining us again next year. That's it from us today here at Parabos. So thanks very much, everybody. Bye for now.